be your jibes now? Your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar. Not one now to mock your own grinning. Quite chap fallen. I'll get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Or get a diamond worth a thousand gold pieces, a 13th level cleric, and have him cast Resurrection. Either's good. Hi folks, welcome to Glitter Void Gamecraft. My name is Eric, and today, rather than whatever this is, I'm building some graveyard scatter terrain. Scatter terrain, if you're not familiar with the term, refers to small to medium pieces of terrain that you place about the table. I mostly hear the term in the context of wargaming, your 40Ks, your Age of Sigmar, something that you literally scatter across the table to set the scene, imply the larger area, without you having to create an absurd amount of terrain to cover something that large. Scrolling with my nose. For my purposes, I'm using it to give myself the option to expand the graveyard from the centerpiece I made in the last video. Placing a few of these pieces around the centerpiece, I can imply the much larger graveyard without having to create several square feet of what would frankly be very repetitive terrain. I show what I mean towards the end of the video, but for now, let's get crafting. The scatter terrain will be composed of several independent bases, each with one or two features that are on theme for a graveyard. Each piece doesn't need to be a whole standalone element. The idea is that two or three of them together will suggest a larger graveyard. A covered staircase down, a freestanding tomb with a statue, like a memorial, several patches of headstones, and so on. All of these will match the graveyard centerpiece that I made last time, so it can be used as a cohesive set altogether. The bases are made from a piece of chipboard. Since it worked so well last time, I pre-coated it with regular Mod Podge. This is to prevent the cardboard from warping due to absorbing too much moisture. I covered both sides and let that dry while I worked on the other features. For the various elements, I used Dollar Store Foam Core Board, the old standby. The covered staircase is made from a few panels of the foam core. Making the wall double thick allows the door to be inset, and the sloping sides allow space for where the staircase descends into the catacombs or the mausoleum. Additional pieces form the roof, with the larger piece being a bit long, so I can cut it to length later to join with the other pieces. I tore the paper off the sides and got to work texturing. Having misplaced my faithful ball of foil, I constructed a crude facsimile out of a new sheet of foil. I mushed the ball up, not forgetting to create a small lip to texture hard to reach places. I rolled the foil ball over the outward facing surfaces to create that classic stone texture. I glued the pieces together using tacky glue, squaring up the corners with the grid of my cutting mat. I pinned the whole thing together to dry, and then cleaned up any glue that glooped out of the seams. I'm not very good at freehanding curved lines, so here's a trick to get any shape that you need to be symmetrical. Fold a piece of paper in half and draw or cut half of the shape. By cutting through both sides of the paper, the image is reflected, and then you can use the cutout to trace the shape. This is great for windows, doorways, details, anything you want to be consistent over multiple pieces. I cut along the trace line and expanded this and the center door cut with a pencil with the lead retracted, creating grout lines in the stonework. The door then slid right inside the opening. I wanted some corner support pieces like the ones I made for the chapel, so I cut some pillars of XPS insulation foam, then cut them more precisely to size. I wanted these to stick up a bit over the top of the structure, so when I cut the corner notches out, I didn't cut all the way down the length of the piece. With many, many shallow cuts, I popped the notch out and some tacky glue held it in place. For the freestanding tomb, I cut a block of XPS foam and traced out a pedestal. After trimming the corners to add interest, I added a lip on the top of the lid. I decided to carve the statue out of a block of XPS foam. Just kidding, I'm painting a miniature in a grayscale. To give it that statuesque look, I needed a multi-tier platform, something large enough for the mini to fit on. I trimmed the corners off to match the tomb, 
leaving the mini separate for priming and painting later. I cut in grout lines on the statue pedestal, as well as cutting out some decorative pieces for the tomb and the statue. The headstones were pretty simple, mostly squarish slabs with a few details cut from cardstock. Just add enough variety so it doesn't feel like all of these headstones were created at the same time. In my internet searching for headstone shapes, I found a picture of a really old gravestone being engulfed by the roots of a dead tree. And I've been looking for an excuse to use up some of my air dry clay, so I decided to make a fifth piece of scatter terrain. I cut a roughly cylindrical hunk of foam into a substructure to build the stump around. You could use foil or pretty much anything that keeps the center from being a dense blob of clay that would take forever to dry. I wrapped the clay around the foam and carved in a bark texture. I rolled out some clay snakes and mushed them into the trunk, making twisted roots. A perfect transition isn't necessary as a lot of this will be masked with ground cover. I built this on a plastic sheet rather than the chipboard base because of the moisture in the clay. This stuff claims to take three days to dry. I can't imagine what that would do to chipboard in that amount of time. I hacked away at the stump to make a slot for the headstone then mushed in a bunch more clay around it to hold everything together. With all the features finished, it was time to figure out the exact layout. Having added a fifth piece of scatter terrain, it was a tighter squeeze than I had planned. I marked out the bases and cut them out. Even though they're only separated from the features for a few minutes, it's a good idea to label them. You'd hate to get halfway through gluing everything together and find out you messed up somehow. Most of the features were attached with tacky glue, but the headstones wouldn't stand up on their own, so I switched to hot glue. As I was going, I noticed a strange space in front of the door of the crypt, so I created a small step, or a stoop. I simply cut out a few small pieces and shaped them to fit into the threshold. For the dirt ground cover, I glooped on a generous amount of glue all over the bases and spread it out with an old brush, making sure to push the glue up against the features of the terrain, as well as all the way out to the edge. I dumped on a generous heaping of sand and let it dry overnight. It's usually a good idea to weigh down pieces while they dry to minimize warping of the base. That's not so hard with solid pieces like the crypt, but with the mostly open space around the headstone, it's a little trickier because a thin layer of sand would allow the glue to seep through and glue the weight to the base. A trick is to put on way more sand than you need, so much so that when you place a weight directly on it, there's no chance that the glue will seep through. Once everything dried, there was a very small amount of warping, but nothing that couldn't be fixed by gently bending the bases back into shape. I scattered some overpriced diorama gravel on the bases and secured it with super glue. If you decide you want any of these rocks right up against anything that's made out of foam, use a different form of glue as the super glue will melt your foam. I did pretty much the same on the fallen tree as I did on the crypt, using a mixture of hot glue and white glue to attach the trunk and a few of the roots that had pulled away from the rest of it as the clay shrunk. Anywhere some of the hot glue had glooped out, I easily hid with either ground cover or later using the mossy flocking. Everything got a coat of Mod Podge mixed with black craft paint. This hardens and protects the foam as well as providing a base coat and sealing all the sand to the bases. I was concerned about the Mod Podge adhering to the clay surface of the tree, so I used Vallejo Surface Primer instead. The stone work, which is pretty much everything else, got a base coat of dark gray, not forgetting the headstone wrapped up in the tree. The tree was supposed to be dead, so I gave it a coat of tan to differentiate it from the brown ground. I created a gate for the crypt, just like the fences from the graveyard centerpiece video, using the same paint scheme as well. The door and several spikes added to the crypt were covered with a brown base coat. I then highlighted the stone with light gray. If it seems like I'm jumping around during the painting, that's because I am. The most time-consuming part of this hobby is waiting for things to dry, so I rarely complete a whole feature before moving on to the next one. I base coat the stone, then move on to the tree, then to the ground, and after that's done, especially with this many pieces, the stone is dry so I can start highlighting. It just makes for a more efficient workflow. I covered almost everything with a black wash. This gets into the cracks and makes all that stone detail really pop. For variation, I picked out a few stone pieces with various colors of wash. When this first goes on, it looks a little intense, but later on highlights tone it down to look more like tinted stone. 
The gate and spikes got a heavy dry brush of gunmetal. The base coat of brown gets mostly covered by the silver, giving it the look of brown rust poking through the metal. A dry brush of black over the top completes the wrought iron look. Adding a dry brush of suede to the stone brings out the higher parts of the stone and the sharp edges of the cardstock details, making it look a little less cartoonish in those very colorful bits. The paint job mostly complete, I got to work installing the metal bits. I trimmed the spikes to an appropriate length and poked some holes in the pillars, glued on the tacky glue and inserted them. The contact points of the gates were covered in tacky glue as well and wedged into the doorway. Time for the flocking. The first layer is made from some store-bought foam flock. I spread out PVA glue in random patches and dumped a bunch on. If you don't have access to this sort of flock, you could also just paint patches of green on the sand ground cover before the homemade flock that I use next. After giving it a bit of time to dry, I tapped off the excess for reuse later. To make some dead looking grass, I chopped up some hemp cord and spread out the individual fibers that were still a little clumped up. To vary the color, I mixed in some store-bought static grass. In my other graveyard video, I didn't like how stark the hemp cord was on its own, so I figured mixing it with a lightish green flocking, it might blend a little better. Spreading out more glue, I dusted this mixture across the bases. This worked pretty well for avoiding the awkward clumping issue, but I think that had more to do with my application process than mixing it with the green grass. This time I dusted the mixture over the base rather than just dropping on big clumps. However, I had only put down a few globs of glue and the fine dusting covered more area. To lock this all in place, I used a mixture of water, rubbing alcohol, and diluted PVA glue in a spray bottle. The alcohol reduces the surface tension which allows the glue mixture to spread all over the base and bind the flock to it. The mini I'm using for the statue has some unusually bulbous ear things that I didn't like so I clipped those off before painting. For priming, I attached the mini to a piece of cardboard using tape so I could hold on to it without getting paint all over myself. I'm using a rattle can primer on this due to its fast drying time and even application. Even though this is going to be a five minute paint job, I wanted to attach the mini to something for ease of holding. Since I planned to hack the round base off anyway, I just used a dab of hot glue. Being a monochromatic statue, the paint scheme was pretty simple. I started with a super heavy dry brush of gray, almost an overbrush really, covering all but the deepest recesses. I generally brush downwards so the upward facing surfaces are all covered, simulating an overhead light source hitting the statue. I mixed some lighter gray with the first gray and repeated as before, just being slightly more sparing in the dry brush. I continued with a pure light gray and then moved on to a white covering less and less until with the white, I was just hitting the sharpest edges and the most prominent features. The face, the tops of the arms, the edges of the staff, etc. And just like that, I'm a miniature painting YouTuber. I could have just painted the circular base stone and glued the whole thing to a pedestal, but the one I had was a little bit too small. And sometimes using the whole miniature looks like you just glued a miniature onto your terrain. So I removed the base using hobby clippers and scissors and got to work pinning the model to the pedestal. I used a pin vise and drilled small holes in the bottom of the statue's feet and super glued in some short bits of a paper clip. I poked some guide holes into the pedestal, covered the pins in glue and pushed them in, removing any excess glue that glued out. I did a final super subtle dry brush on the grass flocking by mixing up a light green. Just a little something to differentiate the very tops of the grass. I then did a final edge highlight on selected stone bits with a white. For both of these, I really made sure there was almost no paint on the brush. This isn't a time to accidentally smudge a big streak of white across your nearly finished piece. Then it was time to seal everything with a spray on matte varnish. And voila, five pieces of graveyard scatter terrain. To a degree, this does a similar job as the graveyard centerpiece, providing a bit of verticality as well as a good deal of cover. You could easily use this to make a smaller graveyard or the ruins of one whose village has been lost to the ravages of time. The main use, however, is expanding the graveyard defined by the centerpiece. You could even expand this to cover as much area as you need, adding additional pieces of scatter to the set. For war games like 40k or Age of Sigmar, expand this to cover an entire table, having your armies clash over the resting places of mighty heroes of old. Or at least to see who gets to keep the best of their bones. 
They spelled his name wrong on the tomb. That's where like 40% of ghosts come from. If you enjoyed the video and all of this, consider giving it a thumbs up and letting me know in the comments any features that I missed in the Scatter Terrain. If you found anything particularly useful, consider subscribing to the channel or sharing it with a friend or your dungeon master. That all really helps me out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. You know, I have another monologue in me. Let me go get my skull.